Um, thank you all for coming out. My name is Brielle. I'm a renting artist at McGuffey Art Center. We are so excited to be able to share this virtual poetry reading with you all through McGuffey. McGuffey is located in a historic elementary school building in downtown Charlottesville and is one of the oldest artist run cooperatives in the country. The Art Center is a community of artists dedicated to practicing art and passing on the creative spirit to the greater Charlottesville community through creating opportunities for increasing access to art for all. Before we get started, I just wanted to run through some quick Zoom etiquette for this session. Um, please be mindful to keep yourself muted for the duration of the talk. The mute button is on the bottom left hand side of the screen. Um, the session is being recorded and will be available for viewing after the talk today on McGuffey's website as well as the YouTube channel. So that being said, if you don't want your face to be recorded, you can turn off your video using the button in the bottom left side hand side of the screen. If you have questions or comments you wanna share or you want to interact with the other folks here today, you can use the chat function to type in questions. The chat, chat function is located in the bottom center of the screen. Um, Derek, who I will be introducing shortly and I will be keeping an eye on the chat box as well as Sri, um, who is welcoming people. And we will bring in relevant questions at a certain point in the discussion. <laughs> We are so happy to have you here today for, for today's poetry reading and discussion with Dorothy Marie Rice as part of the show currently hanging at McGuffey titled Water, the Agony and Ecstasy of the Black Experience. Curated by the Charlottesville Black Arts Collective, CBAC. Water, the Agony and Ecstasy of the Black Experience is a multimedia exhibition featuring the work of 25 black artists from the state of Virginia. The, ex the exhibition seeks to take viewers through a journey using water as a metaphor for the black experience. Artists featured in this exhibition were asked to deliver work exploring the interconnection of water and black life based on prose written by writer and photographer, Corey Price. The exhibition is currently on display on all floors of McGuffey Art Center until the end of March, 2021. Guests can visit the exhibition in person Wednesday through Sunday, one to 5 p.m. and can view the exhibition online at mcguffeyartcenter.com. To begin, I wanted to start with introducing our featured guest for the evening, who many of you probably know. Um, Dorothy, Dorothy Marie Rice. Dorothy is a retired educator who creates poems, essays, and visual art. Her work reflects her curiosity and spirituality. As a self-taught artist, she's willing to experiment and accept imperfection. Tonight she'll be sharing, what's up with this compulsion? Uh, Cries for America, voyeur, and if a mermaid can swim, so can I. Interviewing Dorothy after she reads is Derek Waller. Derek is a photographer and painter residing in Charlottesville. He's an art organizer and is one of the founding members of the Charlottesville Black Arts Collective, as well as a loving father and husband. Thank you for joining us, Dorothy. Would you care to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you'll be sharing today before you share your poems? I'd like to thank everybody who is here this afternoon because on a Sunday, there are a lot of different things you could do. I am an artist. I enjoy looking at things, I enjoy experiencing things. And as my first poem will indicate, I have a compulsion to write. So the title of the first poem is, what's up with this compulsion to write all the time, to document and consecrate my thoughts, although incomplete, until I have rewritten, until I am ready to submit give my poems to some unknown reader who tries to be subjective, that's impossible. The mere humble beginnings of any poem, story, painting, artwork is purely subjective. I am the subject, although I have subjugated phrases, scenes, and significant others, which become objects for me to woman manipulate. So when my submissions are rejected for the hundredth time, though I was too scared or too scarred to count, just like my refusal to calculate how much money I've spent on Weight Watchers meetings, materials and measurements. And even before Oprah became the name of the brand, I paid weekly dues, then monthly, then automatic payments, which I ignored. Finally, I threw away all my membership regalia, scales, cups, books, 
full of stamped coupons, gains, and losses. Next to church going, those Saturday morning events were the most spiritual of my secular extravaganzas. Weight bears a heavy burden on one's psyche. Maybe I am writing to avoid the plethora of tasks, begging, screaming to be done. They are my subjects until dust and clutter get even with me, making me depressed. Is it any wonder that I write to escape those realities? To my credit, I also read what others write and I wonder what our common denominators are. Memories, trauma, celebrations. I wonder what they look like, how they came to be writers and winners. All this stuff, these files and paper and electronic folders will be tossed and forgotten, then tossed when I die. It's a crying shame that my fame will become a footnote for ashes. This is a prologue to the subsequent poems I will read. I just wonder how many of you have heard the name Simone Manuel and Chris Rock. You probably know Chris Rock. Simone Manuel is a two-time Olympic swimmer, the first African-American woman to medal in swimming. And I saw her interviewed just a couple of days ago. Didn't know anything about her until then. And Chris Rock, you know, is a comedian and he decided to learn to swim recently at the age of 55. Next poem. If a mermaid can swim, so can I. I have watched pet goldfish in a bowl, stingrays in an aquarium, koi in my girlfriend's garden pond, hypnotized with their undulations and surprised with their jumps for food. I am currently taking swimming lessons, not this very minute, our day, but in this phase of my life, I have decided to return to the enigma of learning to swim correctly, gracefully, joyfully. No one is a complete beginner if we believe that swimming begins in the amniotic fluid of one's mother's womb. Or even before that, half of my genetic material was swimming crazily in my father's semen. Therefore, swimming for nine months or so before my mother's water broke should make me an advanced beginner at best. So we are fish before we become wrinkled, wet haired mammals. Some people, retain their gills and fish skills, while others learn to fear or avoid the water where they cannot touch the bottom. Such fear is learned because maybe your parents feared the water. Maybe someone threw them in the swimming hole or the creek in the segregated part of town or country catching them off guard and gasping for breath or grasping an arm or watching a cousin drown. Thereafter, walking in the rain, splashing in rain puddles in your favorite yellow galoshes, imitating the little yellow girl with the yellow umbrella on the blue Morton salt box became the extent of your frolic with water, except when bathing and showering. I am sure my mother never learned to swim as a child, even though she was quite an athletic sharecropper's daughter. She could run fast, climb trees, shoot marbles, even beating her older brother. She could walk on stilts made from branches, 
drove rocks across the creek. And later when her family moved to Montclair, she learned to double dutch, roller skate on the sidewalk with her little white friend, Mary Ann. My stepfather, my real father, who had some privilege living in the city, may have learned to swim, but that's mere conjecture. My real father, AKA biological father, may have had creek exposure, but I only met him once when I was grown. But this poem is about swimming lessons, not meeting my unreal father when I became an adult. Rogers Park, my sisters and I really thought we could swim while scarring our knees on the concrete pool in Rogers Park. We wore our little skin tight bathing suits or shorts and halters, our fat butt cheeks making wedges, wading in water, splashing. There was a sliding board where we bunched up on waiting our turn to plunge into the water. We would scrunch into the water, hold our nose, close our eyes, and crawl on our knees on the concrete bottom, pretending to swim. My sister would shiver, legs, lips, shoulder, teeth shattering. But then there were excursions to Candlewood Park and Lake. Candlewood was a man-made body of water with a sandy shore and people would spread out in the shade or the sun and everything picnic would be there. We were often invited by church groups or some other agency to take swimming lessons. That's where we learned how to hold our breath to hold our nose, to swim underwater, but we still really couldn't swim. Hair was another reason we did not know how to swim. Water seeping through swimming caps made the hair nappy. Nappy hair meant washing, earning, combing, and hot curling our hair, scorched hair, ear skin, split ends. But we did have a pool in our backyard one year. Our parents bought an above ground swimming pool. Daddy assembled it and filled it with water, but there was no filter. So he had to pour all of the water out on the ground. Once at a beach in Atlantic City, the waves tugged my bathing suit, briefly exposing my nipples in front of Elijah. He never said a word. But my mother did eventually learn how to swim. She took lessons at the local YWCA, a courageous thing to do in her 50s. And I made sure my son and daughter learned to swim. Summertime lessons and camp at the YMCA. I almost drowned one time in a neighbor's pool. While my son was swimming, he thought my gasp for breath and laughter the bottom of the pool that made me feel secure had abruptly dropped from four to eight feet. I am taking lessons with mostly retired ladies and gentlemen. They encourage me and I encourage them, but I can't seem to catch the catch, the rhythm. I can't seem to make it across the width of the pool without stopping. I consider quitting, but I keep coming back. I keep thinking that today I will be successful. The other swimmers improve daily. They urge me on. They have learned to flip, to dive, but I can float. I can breaststroke. I want to swim the length of this pool before I die. If a mermaid can swim, so can I. The next poem is Voyeur. She speaks Creole, draped in alabaster skin of fire eating griot. 
nostrils flare. Her throaty eloquence immersed in blood. Come in this sacred place, child, with indigo skin. Body of quivering palm leaf, nipples like thumbs, pearls of sweat run down her breast, arms, legs, hips way to reed and gourd. Catfish roam the murky stream, mud oozes through toes. She splashes. Water cools her skin. Her body flashes like an ibis in flight. See no evil, hear no evil, smell no evil. But we are one in the spirit of wind, sand, surf, ebb, flow, flow breeze, grit, mud, creating, sustaining new life. The wind whips the surf, a towering frenzy, foam pounding the shore, salmon ride, currents, leap dams, return to native waters. She baptizes in the name of the mothers, the daughters, and holy spirits. We return to the waters of our birth. And my final poem is Cries for America. Those of you who know me know how very political I am. And this is just one of my many political poems. My voice has changed since I had surgery for the removal of my thyroid. So my singing is not quite up to par. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Imagine a little brown bilingual girl in 1953 singing this melody heart filling, tear streaming of the I sing. Not quite knowing America's conflicted history, but learning to believe that she could still be heir to its promises if she obeyed her teachers and mastered the rule of I before E, except after C. Eventually, she protested, 1963, voted by the meanness of men with dogs, batons, and fire hoses. Sweet land of liberty. She graduates summa cum laude, becomes a teacher, raises a family, still believing in the American way but watches warily as men and women entrusted to uphold democracy foolishly ignore their oath, pledge allegiance to a bully and tyrant who loathes the rule of law, disavows her vote, your vote, their vote, and misbehaves in the awfulest way you ever saw from every mountainside let freedom ring wow that was amazing amazing um, thank you. Thank you for sharing, Ms. Dorothy. Um, I don't know about anyone one else, but I'll have to say um, I could listen to you read all day. <laughs> thank you. I, I really could. I, you kind of get, I almost forgot that I was supposed to be asking you questions because <laughs> I just get lost. I get lost in hearing you, you, you read your, your work. You thank you. Really. Um, so interesting. Um, I'm, I'm so excited to, to one, hear from you again. Um, 
I have had the pleasure of hearing you read these poems um, you know, and this work a few times now. And it's interesting that I hear something different every single time, which I absolutely love. Well, that's good. I think that's that's the beauty of you know poetry and writing. And um, the more sometimes you hear it or read it, you just get something new every single time. So I do have a few questions for you. I definitely, um, you know, as you and I met earlier, or, or la I guess last week, um, we kind of have a little banter anyway. So I, I hope this is sort of a conversation versus just me just asking you a, a ton of questions. Mm -hmm. but I do want to let the, the other participants know that if you have questions, definitely send them over via chat because after I've asked my question, we do want to open this up to, uh, to, to you. Um, so let's start back to the beginning of your artistic career, um, Ms. Dorothy. How long have you been writing poetry and sort of what sparked your initial interest? I think I've always been a curious little girl who was full of wonder. I remember looking up at the sky and thinking about nature and God and how my favorite song when I was a little girl is he has the whole world in his hands. And I really did believe that even though it was kind of counterintuitive. <laughs> so I'm wondering how God was able to hold the whole world in his hands. But I was brought up among very religious people. As a matter of fact, one of my most influential experiences was in the household of the Miller family with my cousin, Muriel Miller, and her brother, Frankie, and her sister, that we call sister, but her name was Virginia. So with Aunt Denny and Uncle Laboff, I think I learned a lot about religion and prayer. So we had prayer all the time. And I think it's just a, a skip and a jump from prayer to poetry because it's another way of expressing one's insights and thoughts and connection with the universe. Wow, that's amazing. I'd never thought about that but it totally makes sense, prayer and, and poetry. And we have another connection. Every time I talk to you, I get another connection. I thought, <laughs> I was, I thought I was the only person that had an aunt that we called sister. <laughs> I have an aunt sister, whose aunt Edna. Aunt sister, yes. Aunt, aunt Edna was called aunt sister <laughs> because, because all her siblings called her sister. sister. Uh -huh. So I grew up thinking my aunt, my aunt, you know, Aunt Edna was named Aunt Sister, so it's too funny, too funny. Um, so I want to ask you about your first poem, uh, What's Up With This Compulsion? Um, and I, I know you gave a little intro into that. Um, is that how you really feel? Are you really always writing? And is that a compulsion of yours, you feel? I think it is. I'm basically a sedentary person. So I'm either reading, writing, or thinking. and so when I wrote that poem, it was just one of those things that came to my mind. Now, not all my poems tell the truth, not, not the immediate truth, but they tell a truth of some sort. And at that particular time, that's what I thought is, what's with this compulsion? Because I felt like I just got to write these thoughts down. I've got to write them now because there is always a sense of urgency if you don't write those ideas, when they come, you lose them. Even if it's overnight, sometimes I'll have thoughts and I'll say, I want to hold on to that thought, but I don't. I have to write it down. If I haven't written it down, it's lost forever. So I think that those of us who write, who create, we have to make take notes almost immediately. Otherwise, Whatever gift we were given, it's gone. But be assured, you'll get another gift, <laughs> but it may not be that gift. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's awesome. So um, tell me a little bit more about your background. I know we, we kind of joked here, but also earlier last week, I guess, uh, we talked about we think we might be related based on some yes. information that I've learned uh, about you and, and where, where your family is from and where you grew up. So tell me a little bit more about your background and then how that has sort of influenced your, your work. Well, I was born in a little area called Level Run in Pennsylvania County. 
and I didn't know it really existed until I was older. I wonder who, who would come up with such a stupid name. And also Hurt Virginia, which I thought was a terrible name. I did not want to acknowledge that I was from one of those places. And later on, I discovered that Grit Virginia is also a part of the community that my family came from. But um, that's where I was born in Pennsylvania County. And our families, the Walpoles and the Wallers, have intermarried for generations. <laughs> so I'm certain that there is a connection with our families. And our family genealogist, Sonia, who, who I believe is on this um, this call, she'll be dragging you in at some point <laughs> with the genealogy. That's wonderful. So how has how your upbringing, upbringing sort of uh, uh, influenced your work, do you feel? Well, my early years were in Virginia. And as I mentioned before, I spent about a year with the Miller family. Uh, my mother was trying to get her life together. So all of us children stayed with family. And that was very common for family, a village, that family village. So one hand washes the other. That's what my mother always said. And then we moved to Danbury, Connecticut, where I received most of my formal education. And uh, that is from, I didn't go to kindergarten. I missed kindergarten. I went to first grade all the way through. My college experiences were also in Danbury, Connecticut. Wow. And then I came to Richmond, Virginia, because my mother always wanted to come back home. And the closest she could get to home, which was in Hurt, Virginia, was Richmond. But after she settled in Richmond, she got a little piece of land and a trailer. <laughs> and she would frequently visit back home. And whenever she would go back home, she would have these wonderful stories. And she took us on tour. She showed us the graves. She showed us the schools. She showed us all the places that had been in her memory bank. And I didn't appreciate much of it until much, much later. I always thought, how weird to be so obsessed with the past. But that past was something that held our family together, family stories, which I always loved listening to. That's amazing. And, 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 and obviously is reflected in your writing, which is- Thank you. Which is beautiful. Uh, and you didn't go to kindergarten. That's an interesting story too. I didn't. My sister went to kindergarten and I walked her to her class and I loved walking her to her class to Mrs. Delano. I'll never forget. She was such a pretty teacher. And all the things that I can tie my shoe, I can count to, and all those things were on the in her room. And I was just so... Every time I walked my sister to class, I got love from Mrs. Delano, who became my eighth grade English teacher. Talk about love. I was, I just felt finally I had Mrs. Delano as my own teacher. That's amazing. That's awesome. So I want to talk about another one of your poems, um, Voyeur, so, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I, I really love. Um, Thank you. What, what sparked the idea for this piece? I don't know. <laughs> it was written so long ago. I, I know it was written at least 30, maybe 40 years ago. Wow. And I, I don't know where it came from, but I'm sure it was an aggregation of, of thoughts and experiences. Um, I really wish I knew, <laughs> but I think that I was influenced by, again, the water. I probably been at the beach. My husband and I used to go to Myrtle Beach a lot. And that was our, one of our favorite places to go. And more recently, I went to this, um, oh, there's a beach in Buckrow Beach. My parents used to talk about Buckrow Beach all the time. So the painting that I submitted for this exhibit is my daughter walking on Buckrow Beach. Wow. That's amazing. 
That's amazing. So um, another interesting thing, I, I, well, what I love is um, your writing is, is very personal. You know, you're talking about some of your background and your history. And, um, you know, for example, if a mermaid can swim, so can I, which I absolutely, we just joked about this a few minutes ago. <laughs> absolutely, that title, I, I don't know how you came up with it, but it is, it, it's beautiful. And it, Thank it you. totally accompanies your piece, um, which, which is which ab absolutely amazing. Um, I know for me, sometimes it's a little difficult to so, so open up in my writing when I, whenever I write. Is, do you ever find that as a challenge to, you know, being so personal and opening up when you actually are, are writing? Do you feel, you know, vulnerable um, yes. when you do so? Yes, but I've, since I've earned these years of wisdom, I Love think that. I've earned the right to say what I think and feel and uh, but still... I don't want to misrepresent anyone or any experience. And of course, all of us have had different experiences and interactions with people. For example, even though my siblings and I grew up in the same household, we have different stories. We have different reactions to certain things our parents said or did. My sister's story may not jive with my story and I'm still trying to correct her. <laughs> 60 years later said, no, that's not what happened. Or we will have similar memories, things that we did. But everybody has a different perspective. And I think we have to respect that. I think the writer has to respect that other people may not agree with what the writer says and, the, and vice versa. Love that. And I know you're going to swim the limits of that pool, too. <laughs> I, love that. I love that um i wanted to i was reading a little bit about your bio and what there was one line that that jumped out at me that i wanted to ask you a question about because i think as an artist it's something that i personally um i struggle with but i think one of the most interesting lines was it states as a self-taught artist she is willing to experiment and accept imperfection and yeah. accepting imperfection that for me is a difficult thing. And I think that's a difficult thing for many. Um, how, do you, how do you sort of apply that to your writing or your art? And you know, how, how do you overcome you know, putting out in the world something that you, you do you feel is imperfect? Because I have not been formally trained, I compare myself to people who have, and often people who are formally trained look at people like me as I hate to say it may be less worthy. And so there, there is, of course, a hierarchy in the arts. And I'm often excluded from that hierarchy. But because of my persistence, I've been able to get into some of the places, for example, um, Crossroads Gallery took a chance on me. Um, artworks took a chance on me, even though I'm not one of the known people, but just looking at my authentic work. And so by getting those, and first of all, my family accepted my work and said, ooh, uh, that's nice. And I said, really? So by getting those kinds of encouragements from people that you care about and that are going to be honest with you. For example, my granddaughter will say, am I, it needs a little bit more color or, well, you don't need that. And I'll go, oh no. So it's always a process, but I have been blessed because the people that I love and the people that love me continue to encourage me. My cousin has purchased some of my artwork. My, my best friends have purchased some of my artwork. Now, to me, that's a thrill. I haven't had a lot of work purchased, but just the fact that they've seen the work and they've seen the authenticity. And I feel like whatever God gives me is worthy. So even though I'm constantly working at something, I might do five um, drafts of something. And each one's going to be totally different. So the picture of Tanya, the swimmer, I did about three drafts and neither, none of them really looked just like her, but she was the impetus for it. 
Wow, that's and awesome. there's Tanya. She is uh, she's really beautiful, and that's the, as that's one of the three images that I created from her. She is an adult swimmer, and in in a year, she went from being uh, a non-swimmer to I believe she may have her um, lifeguard credentials wow. by now. I don't know what happened during COVID, but uh, she was also very inspiring. And um, she represents that a drive that we have to try to overcome something. As a teacher, I've always taught other people what I knew and what I had mastered well. But this swimming was something that I had to learn to overcome. So I had to keep trying because I always encourage my students to keep trying no matter what. Wow, that's amazing. I, 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 I'm doing the same with running right now, actually. I've never been a runner and, uh, <laughs> I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm really bad at it, but uh -huh. because I'm bad at it, it just, it, it actually makes me want to, to continue to, to improve. So I can relate there too. Um, and actually, um, speaking of, of the artwork too, because that, that leads me into my, my final two questions actually. Um, well, first, um, it seems that you do have a strong connection with water. Um, because, you know, in your writing and your, your, your painting, I mean, obviously, you know, you are drawn to, to water. Um, what was it that made you uh, apply for this, you know, this show, Water the, water, the Agony and Ecstasy of the Black Experience? What the was the driver? The title was so appropriate because when I think about my experience and the people that I know, so many Black people are are afraid of the water. They well, they like going to the beach, but there's still this this fear overall, generally speaking, this fear of drowning. And even people who know how to swim drown. So we have to always be on our guard. But going to the water is so refreshing. It connects you to the universe when you watch the waves come and go and you look at the animals, the creatures that are there on the beach and the birds that are flying, it just makes you a part of the whole, which is so vast and so miraculous. So to me, the water is, is we are the water and the water is us. That's amazing. Um, and then, you know, had you, you know, I, I don't even know how many people on, on this, um, this call knew that you actually were an artist, because I, I know in the title of the, of the um, you know, our Zoom today was a poetry reading. But I, don't know if any, I don't know how many people knew that you also um, were a visual artist as well, which I think is absolutely amazing. And so these pieces are, are pieces of Dorothy's um, that are in, in the show. Um, so how long have you been been painting? Did, have you been painting as long as you've been, you know, writing or is this no. a thing? I'll tell you when I started to become a visual artist during my husband's hospice, I was held hostage. I couldn't go anywhere except to the next level. So one day I said, I think I'll just draw something. And there was a photograph of my grandson first time he went fishing and I thought that looks like fun and so I did a quick sketch of that and then one of my dear friends saw it she's now deceased her name is Jeanette Drake she's also a poet she said Dorothy I love it and I said you do as a matter of fact she bought it wow and she wanted to give it to her son, Robbie. I don't know if Robbie's on the call or not. But again, I've always been blessed with someone who saw something in my writing or something in my art that resonated with them or connected in some way. And for that, I'm really grateful. That is amazing. That is really, really wonderful. So. I, um, I actually think I am, those were my questions. So, um, Riel, if you wanted, if you, I haven't been checking the chat, but if you have any other questions that have come through that you wanna ask. 
We do. Yes. Let's open it up to, to questions from the attending audience. I have a couple in here. Let me scroll back up to the originals. Let's see. I believe While she's doing that. I'm so honored to have had this time with you. Well, thank you. I feel the same way. Really amazing. We may be cousins. We may be cousins. <laughs> Sonia will find out. <laughs> this is into the beginning of a long friendship. <laughs> That was that was truly one of the best interviews I think I've ever witnessed. So, oh, wow. thank you, thank you, guys. Um, I do have a question here from Corey Price. Um, how do you know when you found the right metaphor or imagery to use in your poems? The connection to swimming in our mother's wombs was so perfect that I'm curious as to how you settle on what feels right in your poetry. I just let it come, and I accept it, and I always trust that what comes. Is supposed to be there. Now, one of the problems I have as a writer and um, painter, artist, is overdoing it. My husband used to always warn me to leave it alone. <laughs> I would say, honey, what do you think of this? And he would say, mm. and I didn't know how to, I didn't know what that meant. Does it mean you like it or what? It's okay. And then I'd go and add something to it. He said, why'd you mess it up? <laughs> so I sometimes feel my husband's spirit when I'm writing and I was okay don't overdo it because sometimes I want to say too much and then I realize that maybe that's another poem or maybe that goes somewhere else it's a really good point over keeping things in their simple essence is hard <laughs> it can be really hard <laughs> I have a poem, uh, sorry, not a poem, a question from Carolyn Caps. Have you thought about combining the poetry with the paintings in book form? Yes, I have, but I need, I guess I need a nudge and I need a mentor. I need, I need someone to help me with that process because I have lots of paintings and I have lots of poems and I'm not getting any younger. It's, I mean, the, the, the world deserves to see what I have produced. That's so if there's anyone with an earshot that can say, I can assist you, call me. <laughs> and we'll see what we can get together. Perfect. Um, I have a question from Muriel Miller Branch. How did teaching poetry help you develop? Muriel. <laughs> how to teach in poetry well when you teach you learn so every time for example I went into a classroom because I used to do poets in the school and that was an opportunity a gift every time I went in to share my poetry I would get such a wonderful vibe from the young young people they just naturally are inclined to poetry. And one of the poems that I did, it was a poem uh, about Muriel's father entitled, He Seemed So Tall. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to try to remember it. Being lifted to his shoulders when I was a girl is one of the images that begins to unfurl, riding to church on a rocky road in a 52 pickup carrying it eager load of children singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He seems so tall, wearing bib overall, sweat pouring from his brow as he planted his crop with a mule and a plow. Coming in at dusk with a smile on his face, I would run to him with a kiss and a tender embrace, he seemed so tall. Of problems and setbacks he had his share, but always rebounded with a sweet hour of prayer. Yes, a noble man and preacher with a self-made style, he seemed so tall when I was a child. Although he wasn't perfect, I remember him that way. He seemed so tall then and still does today. 
once I shared that poem with the students, oh my goodness, they would say, oh, who's that about? Is that God? Is that Jesus? And they could identify with someone like, said, what does it mean? He seems so tall. And they were able to go past the, the height. They didn't even think about height. They're talking about he was, he was noble. He was, he was respectful. He was all of the other images that come when you think of tall, not just height, but you think about character. And that's what teaching poetry has helped me with because it shows me that there are connections and those connections, other people expand on those connections and feel the emotion and see, see what I see, hear what I hear and feel what I feel, but they relate it to their own circumstances. Wow. We got a bonus reading. I feel <laughs> the time was right. <laughs> that was so that powerful. Sort of answers Darcy. that question. Yeah, it does. And actually, there are quite a few people in comments. Um, we'll, we'll be saving the comments so that you okay. can read them afterwards. All but, right. Thank um, you. But there are so many people saying that you really do visually carry people along through your poetry, and you really take them on the journey with you and it's it's really it's so effective that way you're very transportative with your pieces it's amazing thank you this has um, been a privilege for me good we have more questions do you have it in you yes you want to keep going? okay <laughs> but eric has to do something too so <laughs> gotta share the stage no you're no, the no, star. This is all about you <laughs> oh well, thank you i've got um Let's see here. Um, our next question. How, oh no, we already got that one. Sorry, I'm trying to track them. Um, oh yeah, Patricia Burrell says, what's next? What are you eager to do? Pat, <laughs> there is some, I definitely, here's one thing I am committed to out of the I know hundreds of poems I have. I finally decided to put them in categories and each category has become a, I'm calling it a book. So I have my spiritual ones. I have some that's called, uh, one called sexy. <laughs> and different categories. So I have spiritual, um, personal different categories of poems with titles that are very seductive. As a matter of fact, one of my seductive, but not in a sexual way poems is entitled, A Impromptu Date with My Grandson on a Saturday Afternoon Becomes Monumental. <laughs> And that's a poem about me taking my grandson to see an exhibit at the uh, VCU ICA, what is it? The Institute of Art at uh, Contemporary Art. And there was an installation that was amazing. And while we were there, it was a multi-dimensional kind of experience. And I wrote a poem about that. It's a prose poem too. Amazing. I'm so excited about this book, the world, these books. <laughs> You'll have to keep us posted. Thank you. Um, I will. We have, yes, email us. We would love to try to get that communication out to everybody if we can. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I've got another couple questions. Um, people are thoroughly enjoying this time with you in the comments. Uh, did you ever consider recording your poems like a poem podcast or a YouTube channel? Yes. Again, uh, if there's anyone out there who has those skills and talents, I'm available. I'm retired now. <laughs> so that is something I have thought about. Before my voice changed, I thought about that. And then after my voice changed, I said, I'm not so sure I could sustain it. But some people like my new voice. They say it's sexy. <laughs> but my other voice was very soothing. 
I feel like it's still soothing. As Derek said, we could all listen, <laughs> we could all listen to you read for hours and hours. Thank you. My husband used to say, I would put him to sleep because I would read a poem or even something from a book. And I would say, honey, hon, and he'd be snoring away. I would have put him to sleep. So I know I can do that. I can hypnotize people. I love it. And okay. Sort of an ad hoc, ad hoc comment because Dorothy, you do, I did find out that you do already have a book that is out, out there. Yes, The Seventeenth Child, which my mother and I collaborated on. I'm not so sure. Oh, let's see how, well, I can't seem to show it from here, but it's um, a compilation of those short stories that my mother used to tell me. And uh, it's also a, a memoir. However, it's out of print and I need to work for it getting that restored to print because it's a beautiful book. It's universal, even though it's a first person narrative about her growing up during the depression. As a matter of fact, she was born just a few months after the depression and the struggles, the hard scrabble life that they experienced, but also the joys and the love and faith that families have that have sustained them. So that um, I really need to work on getting this reprinted. It's called The 17th Child. And it connected us with some family members that we didn't know that happened to have seen it online some years ago. And so now we're real close friends and they're related to the Wallers too. <laughs> they are um, the Dodsons. So we have the Dodsons that uh, we connected to. We didn't know they were my mother's, they are my mother's brother's grandchildren. Wow. Dorothy, Muriel has outed you as co-writing another book as well um, with her. Oh yes, yes. She was, she was my first co-author. <laughs> We did two books on Maggie Walker. And uh, the first one was Miss Maggie, that's out of print. And the second one was From Pennies to Dollars, that's also out of print. But I have to say they did very well and they really started a movement because it was Muriel's dream to write about Maggie Walker before it I didn't even know a thing about Maggie Walker but she said cuz do that's when she called me cuz now she calls me sis <laughs> she said do you want to write a book with me about Maggie well, I said Maggie Walker I didn't know a thing about her that was back in 19 late um 1970s and I think that book came out in 1982 or three prior to that there was very little scholarship about Maggie Walker. And Muriel and I were, became members of the Maggie Walker Historic Foundation. And I do believe that we were a seed to so much of what's happening with the Maggie Walker legacy. Wow. That's amazing. I'm going to find all these books somehow or let us know when they go to reprint okay that's a, one more thing for me to do, for us to do. <laughs> one more nudge <laughs> um okay we also have people in the chat box who are who are going to connect you potentially to people who can help with some of these projects well says, thank so you that's thank you lord um and that's that's yeah, <laughs> that's the last um, question I have in the chat box at the moment. If anybody else has any more, now would be the time to add those in. I would like to comment to... that the, the photo that's behind me seemed to be accidental as I was scrolling to trying to find a background picture. And then the, this bromeliad appeared. Well, that's my daughter's birthday bromeliad. <laughs> and this is her porch, her patio. and. I just think God wanted me to have that in the background. So Lisa and Jalea and AJ, if you're on, 
just know that you're being represented. Love it. Very nice. Love that. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And also you're welcome for, for Derek to Derek because you guys did an incredible job, such an interesting conversation, such beautiful words. And I think we've all had a great Sunday afternoon, thanks to you too. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. This is Sister Joy. I have enjoyed all of it. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Wonderful. We have a couple little announcements if you wanna hear about what McGuffey is doing next for this show, a couple more events this month. Um, we have some upcoming events. We've got the virtual artist talk with a selection of eight or nine artists um, from the water exhibition coming up on March 11th at 5.30 p.m. The artist talk will feature Sahara Clemens, Clinton Helms, Leslie Lillard, Benita Mayo, Corey Price, Benford D. Stelmacher Jr., and Derek Waller and Marley Nichelle. So quite a few amazing voices in that conversation as well. Um, during that talk, each of the individual artists will speak a little bit about their creative process and talk about their works featured in this exhibition. Um, you can RSVP or register to attend this artist talk on our main website. So if you head to mcguffey.com for that. Uh, next weekend on Saturday, March 13th from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m., we'll be hosting in-person appointments for a photography session with artist Corey Price. Corey will be inviting the community to take part in a portrait series to explore their connection to the first enslaved Africans who arrived at Point Comfort in 1619 and to reflect on how their lives impact the history we're all currently creating together. Um, people interested in signing up or learning more can take a look at the link on our main website as well. There are several more events coming up this month that will open up um, for registration in this coming week. We'll be hosting two more readings, one poetry reading with Adrian Oliver and a book reading with Larry Giles. Um, we'll also be hosting a short film screening and director Q&A with Ellis Finney on Saturday, March 20th. Um, sorry, Saturday, March 27th. Um, and then I think that is all. We And all of these can be ours to be key to attend through our main website. Um, Water, the Agony and Ecstasy of the Black Experience is still on display and will be on display until the end of the month, March 28th, 2021. You can still come see the exhibition during McGuffey Art Center's public hours, which are Wednesday through Sunday from 1 to 5 p.m. We're showing special tours for small groups interested in taking a tour of the exhibition guided by several members of the curation committee. If you're interested in attending a tour, please email us. Our email is listed on our main website. The exhibition is on display on our website as well at mcguffeyartcenter.com. You can actually go and see a, a full virtual tour of the show, which is pretty exciting if you can't come in person. Um, so thank you again to everybody for coming out on this Sunday to join us, and we hope you have a great rest of your weekend. And I'm so grateful to Dorothy and Derek. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. I actually have a piece of Stelmarker's work right behind me. It's called the Kamala Stroll. When, that he he did a, a trilogy. And oh, cool. this was, oh, can you all see it? And this is one of his part of the trilogy um, for when Kamala, after she was, um, became VP. So, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, that's nice. the picture that's always behind me. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> because I mean, we're sorority sisters. So of course, you know, I wanted to have the trio of his pieces, but that was installment one, huh? installment one of his piece. So oh, good. Nice. Very nice. good guy. Very good. Talented, just Absolutely. extremely talented. He is. Dwight uh -oh. is am amazingly talented. <laughs> I've become good friend. I feel like a good friend with him, like over this process of right. the show. Like we 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 talk and chat all the time. Yeah, but he's he just is a good guy. So talented. Oh my gosh. Um, it, interestingly, a uh, thing that I, I I just it just wows me every time I see his work is he hasn't showed he had not really shown a lot of his work at a a gallery before. At a gallery. Right. When you saw, yeah. we saw it, it's just breathtaking. Yeah.
Right. Yeah. He was he was excited when he um got this opportunity and he was like, guess what? I was like, oh, that's cool. That is awesome. So, you know, and it, just the way that I guess artists, period, <laughs> just it drops in your head and it goes from here to here. It just it's mind blowing to me. <laughs> <laughs> It's magic. It's mind, it, it is. It's magic. It's magic. <laughs> I can do that with words, but not with paint. <laughs> Derek, I told you Sonia would draw you in. <laughs> Absolutely. I love her. I love her. We all do. She's our love bug. <laughs> Absolutely. I can I can feel it already. I know. <laughs> all right. You all have a great evening, but I just had to give him a shout out. I was like, hey, it's right here. Yes. <laughs> Yes. All right. Thank all you right. all. We'll Take stay care. in touch. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. I'm stopping the recording now. <laughs> How do we